sometimes we're just like Peter. And it's quick to wag a finger and say, how could you do that, Peter? But you could wag it right back in your own face. So what is the context of this event? There are, in fact, two. Matthew chapter 14 is the text that was read to us. If, you're, if you shut your Bible, open it back up there. That's where we're going to be for the sermon. Matthew 14. The context of this are two famous events that took place just before Peter and Jesus walking on water. The most immediate of which is the feeding of the 5,000. So just before the storm and the disciples going on the boat and all of that, the very previous thing that happened was Jesus fed 5,000 people plus women and children. That is, men plus women and children. Thousands of people, this amazing, glorious miracle. But to understand the emotional significance of that very famous miracle, go back one more event. The event just before that is the beheading of John the Baptist. And so the news reaches the ears of Jesus that his cousin, his friend, his fellow minister, his fellow proclaimer of the gospel kingdom to come, has been brutally, shamelessly murdered by Herod. John the Baptist is dead. The word reaches Jesus. He does not even have a moment to process that person's death, to grieve over that loved one's death, before immediately, the very next thing they say to Jesus is, and there's thousands of people here, and they're all hungry, and we don't have any food. And so Jesus has to say, okay, tell everybody to sit down. How much food do we have? A few baskets. Okay, here, spread it out among everybody. And they feed 5,000 plus people with food left over to spare. And then once all that's done, my Lord, who can't even process because he has other things he has to tend to, finally he's tended to them. Now he gets to say to the disciples, go, go over to the other side of the, the river, or the, the, the sea. We're in um, Bethsaida. Go over to Gennesaret. I'll meet you there. Well, what are you going to do, Lord? I'm going to go up into the mountains and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to meditate. And probably I'm going to think and reflect on the death of my friend, which I haven't been able to do yet. So you go on. I'll catch up with you. I'll meet up with you there. That's the context of this. The disciples separating from their Lord and going off to the other side of the sea. Should be an easy journey. I marked it on the map for you. It's not like they're crossing, you know, the Mississippi here, going from north to south. It's a very simple, easy, short, commonly traversed journey over the, the, the uh, Sea of Galilee. They're just moving from one northern city to the other northern city. Very simple, very easy, but as you know, things are not always so easy. That's the context. Let's get into the content now. I know Michael read it, but let's read it again and make some notations along the way. The ship was in the middle of the sea, tossed with waves. The wind was, the King James is, contrary this is a storm that's popped up. And in the fourth, fourth watch of the night, three in the morning, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, Matthew doesn't say it here, but if you read Mark's account of the same event, it says that Jesus was walking so casually and so calmly, it was as if he didn't even see them. It's, it's like someone taking a stroll, you know, in the morning down the sidewalk or down the parking lot to get the mail, to get the paper. That's as calmly, as casually as Jesus was walking. He sees them. It's as if he didn't see them. That's how calm he was. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. It's a spirit. It's some supernatural thing. They couldn't recognize it as Jesus, probably through the haze of the storm around them. And so they cry out in fear. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. It is me. Have courage. It's just me. Everything's going to be okay. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you. You know, we, everyone knows. I mean, raise your hand if you didn't know Peter walked on water and then sank. Everyone knows this account. This is a very famous account in the Bible. But I think the way we have kind of summarized it to kind of shorthand it is we always say, they saw Jesus walking on water, and then Peter said, Lord, can I walk on water too? But that's not exactly what he says, is it? What Peter says is, Lord, if it is you, then cause me to walk on the water. We call that an imperative. This is once again Peter, not requesting permission from his master, but just bluntly saying, hey, command me to come out there. Invite me to come out there. Peter, slow your roll a little bit. Cause me to come on the water with you. And Jesus says, come. So Peter was come down out of the ship and he walks on the water to go to Jesus. But then he saw the wind was, the King James says, boisterous, heavy, intense, remarkably strong, the winds were. Were the winds not strong 10 seconds ago when he was asking to get out there? Yeah, but he had faith 10 seconds ago. Ten seconds ago. Now the wind is strong and the wind is boisterous and he looks at it and he's afraid. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and the King James says he was beginning to sink. And he cries saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand 
and caught him and said unto him, Oh, you of little faith. What a thing to say to someone who was just standing on water. But we'll get there in a minute. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. So there's the content. Let's break it down. Once again, they're making a relatively easy journey. These are, not all of them, but many of them, experienced fishermen. And probably all of them experienced sailors. It was just a common mode of transportation other than walking. And so they're making what should be a routine journey from Bethsaida to Gennesaret. And as you see on the map, not a big journey either. And these people, being experienced fishermen, are used to being in a storm on a boat. Now, they don't handle it very well. We have a historical record of that. There was a previous occasion when they're on a boat in a storm, and Jesus is sound asleep, which should have been a clue not to worry. And they wake him up and they say, we're going to die. But hey, maybe that was a really big storm. And all the other ones they've encountered were no big deal. Well, this one they're going to encounter is a pretty big deal. And if you know anything about the terrain, the topography and all this, if you've heard anyone preach on the Sea of Galilee, probably it's come up, how it's kind of in a, in a basin, it's kind of in a low set area, and there's mountainous regions all around it. So it makes it perfect, uh, in a perfect environment for little pop-up thunderstorms. You know, the, the skies might look good, and halfway to the journey, the skies get suddenly very bad, and then the rain gets suddenly very bad, the wind gets suddenly very bad. But in this case, the storm is so bad that the wind drives their boat from where they were, Near the northern part of the sea to, the King James says, the middle of the sea. That's on the intense wind, which makes it even more remarkable. A part of the miracle we don't really think about when they see Jesus walking on the water and the wind that is so strong that it's knocking this boat completely off course. He's walking through it like it's not even windy at all. Right. You ever consider that? We always focus on Jesus feet. We don't think about how the rest of him is, is just slicing right through the wind as though it's not even there. He's not, he's not struggling to get to them. He's just strolling like it's a perfectly fine afternoon, walking on the water to them. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you, cause me to walk on the water. Now, let's not spend too much time on the if it is you thing. I think this is Peter being cheeky. I think he knows it's Jesus. I think he doesn't want to come out and say, I want to walk on water too. So he words it in such a way to kind of get to that point. If it is you, Jesus, then cause me to walk on the water too. Invite me. Invite me out there onto the water with you. And rather than debate the issue, Jesus just says, come. Come out onto the water with me. And so Peter, having never walked on water before, gets out of the boat. And now stands on water as though he's standing on dry ground. He was his feet. I'm going to see this because I don't want to split my pants. His feet were just on planks of, of wood, solid, sturdy. And he steps out onto water, solid, sturdy. Can you appreciate that? How remarkable that is that he did that without any hesitation, without any second thought, without any worry about, well, what if I just walk right to the bottom like a rock? Because his master said, come, he went. And here's a person of such tremendous faith, Peter, that he did it without any hesitation or without any thought to the storm. Yeah, I know what the next verse says. But in this moment, there's a huge storm howling and Peter doesn't give it a second thought. All Peter sees is his master. And he fixes his eyes on Jesus And he steps out of that boat and he walks to Jesus. So we can start wagging fingers and we can say, yeah, but. But let's just appreciate that Peter's standing on water. He had the faith to get out of the boat and walk to Jesus. But you know what happens next. That same storm that he was not focusing on, that he didn't care anything about, that it wasn't a big deal, suddenly becomes a big deal. It's the same storm. It didn't grow more intense. It's just Peter... His eyes wandered. He got distracted. By the storm of distraction, his eyes darted away. He starts to look away. And then the Bible says the most remarkable thing. I don't know what translation you're reading out of. My Bible says beginning to sink. Does your Bible say something like that? He was beginning to sink. Now, everybody just stop and remember being a kid and throwing a rock in a body of water. Who's seen a rock begin to sink? No, you haven't. You throw a rock in the water. And it's gone. Stones don't begin to sink. They just sink. People also don't begin to sink. 
They just sink. And yet here is Peter. And I got, I got this in front of me, so I'm going to do a magic trick. You ready? This is, I'm Peter. He's beginning to sink, right? The miracle is still ongoing. So Peter is, is with the Lord. He takes his eyes off the Lord. And suddenly the Lord is getting higher and higher. Because he is slowly beginning to realize the mistake he just made. Which is, I should not have taken my eyes off my Lord. And he starts to thrash and to splash and to worry and to panic. And he screams, save me, Lord. Well, look to him. And you'll see his hand is already stretched down. And sure enough, Jesus grabs him and pulls him up. And that's usually where we stop. Or maybe, maybe we read Jesus' statement, oh, you have little faith. And we don't really consider what he says. And we just talk about how you need to have more faith in Jesus. You need to have more faith in Jesus because Peter didn't have enough faith in Jesus. And we try to compare Peter to ourselves, which we're going to do in a different way in just a second. And we say, well, look, Peter, you need to have more faith, Peter, because you took your eyes off Jesus. You need to have faith. And we're like, I wouldn't have gotten out of that boat. How could I possibly make a statement like that? I would have been where John was or where Matthew was or where Thomas was or any of the other ones. I would have been on the boat watching Peter wondering what was going to happen. I'm not getting out of the boat. I tell you this, even if Jesus, if I, was, if I was that Matthew on the boat, even if Jesus had said, boom, Peter, hey, Matthew, you come here, I would have been like, no, I'm fine. And I would have stayed on the boat. I mean, I probably would have obeyed my master, but if he had given me the option, I would have taken option A, and I would have stayed on the boat. I'm not getting out of that boat. So let's not be too hard on Peter. He got out of the boat, okay? But nevertheless, Jesus says to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and it's that second phrase that we forget. Because Jesus defines the problem with Peter's face, faith here in the very next phrase. It's not that, oh, you didn't have enough faith, Peter, period. A big blanket statement because he had plenty of faith. He got out of the boat. It was that he stopped having faith. He began to doubt. Let's not compare Peter's faith to John's faith. I mean, Jesus, what are you doing saying Peter had little faith? John didn't get out of the boat. Because Jesus isn't comparing Peter's faith with John's faith. Nor does Jesus compare your faith with someone's faith over here. Or someone's faith here with someone's faith over there. Jesus does not compare our faiths to each other. We are all running the same race, but we are running it individually. We are all going to the same goal, but we are going to reach that goal. If we all reach that goal, and it's going to look differently. Because some of us are going to stumble and fall in different ways or in different amounts of time. We're going to stumble. I'm going to stumble a thousand times. You might only stumble three times. So it's going to look a lot messier, my journey from here to the goal, than yours will. But it's the same goal. We can encourage each other on the way to that goal. But you don't compare your race to someone else's race. You don't compare Peter's faith with John's faith or James's faith or anyone else. Peter had enough faith to get out of the boat. But Peter did not have enough faith to keep his eyes on Jesus. That was Peter's problem. Oh, you little faith. Why did you doubt and then he picks him up and walks him back to the boat. I had this thought last night. I come up here every, every Saturday night before I preach on Sunday. I come up here and I do a dry run. It's always much better than it is on Sunday morning. I come up here and I do a dry run. I preach the whole sermon to an empty audience, which is also my nightmare for a Sunday morning scenario. But I come and I preach the, the sermon to nobody. And as I'm doing it, I always have my pen in my notes. And I'll, I'll start preaching it without looking at my notes to make sure I know it. And then I'll have a thought that will pop in my head. I'll think, oh, that's really good. I'll write that down. And that's why, I, that's why I practice, because it's always better on Saturday night, and I'll think of new things. And last night, I was finishing, and as I always do, I walked to the back, and I sat in the back pew, and I scrolled through the slides to make sure they looked okay from the back. And as I was doing it, I got to this slide right here, and I thought, actually, it was this slide right here, and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. So Peter gets out of the boat, he's walking on water, okay? He starts to sink into the water. Jesus picks him back up. So now Peter is once again standing on water. And it says, they came into the ship. They got from the water back to the ship. Which means Peter had to walk on water again to get back to the boat. God is a God of second chances. Imagine if you were watching the scenario and Peter sinks and he gets picked up. You think, well, you blew it, Peter. Apparently not. Because he walks on water again. To get back to the boat. You're going to make mistakes. So let's compare ourselves to Peter. Sometimes we are just like Peter. Peter was inquisitive. That's a good thing. Let's be like that. 
Lord, if it is you, cause me to come out of the water. As we summarize it, can I come out of the water too? What kind of a question is that? John turns around to ask. Of course you can't get out of the water. And Jesus says, excuse me. Yes, he may. You never know unless you ask. Peter was an asker. Peter was a seeker. Peter was a desirer to learn. You can say a lot of things negative about him. You can never once question Peter's desire to grow and to increase his abilities and his talents for the Lord. He sought and he often found. Peter took initiative. Peter, you can come out of the water. I have given you permission to walk on water. As I said, I would have said, that's great to know. And I would have never done it. But Peter was a doer. He was a go-getter. He took initiative. How long have you been a member here? Everybody here has a different answer to that. How long have you been a member here? Well, I can read a scripture on Sunday morning, but I couldn't do a devotion on Wednesday night. We're giving you permission. Take the step. Do it. Well, I could do a devotional on Wednesday, but I could never teach a class on Sunday morning. You have permission. Try it. You may be a spectacular failure, as everyone who's ever taught a class has ever been on class one. But you keep trying. You, st- you stumble, you fall, you pick up, you try again. You keep doing it. Well, I could teach a Sunday morning class, but I could never preach a sermon. By the way, it's easier to teach a class than it is to preach a sermon. But anyway, I could teach a class, but I could never preach a sermon. Yes, you can. Take the step. Do it. You can do it. Well, I could teach a sermon, but I could never preach full time. Yes, you can. There's a church that needs you. Go over here and do it. You have an opportunity to serve. Well, I could, I could, I could make a phone call, but I could never go see someone. Yes, you can. You're, you, you, we're giving you permission. God has given you permission to take that next step. You are comfortable. Get out of the boat. Walk on the water. Peter took initiative. Learned from that lesson. But Peter was also inconsistent. Just like we are too. As much as there is to emulate, there's also enough we can say, I relate. Peter was inconsistent. <laughs> but so are we. Peter stumbled. Peter fell. Peter sank into the water. And Jesus picked him up. And walked him back to the boat. You can be that way too. When you are inconsistent. And when you stumble. And when you fall. You might want to say that's it. I've given up. I can't do it. Obviously I failed. So I'll always fail. That's not Christianity. Christianity is salvation from your failures. Present and future tense. You're going to make more mistakes. And your father in heaven and his son is going to continue to be there. With his hand down ready to grab you and pick you back up. You just need to put your faith in him. Put your eyes on him and walk with him. So where are you this morning? Are you standing firm on the water? Great. Take the next step. Keep walking. Are you sinking in the water? Okay. We've all been there. Find the Lord. If you don't know where he is, we want to help you find him. Put your eyes back on him. Grab his hand and walk again. If you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Put your sins to death in repentance. Bury them in baptism. Rise to walk from the water of your grave, a new person in Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, but you've stumbled and you've fallen and you're sinking in the water, can we help you come back home? Can we help you come back to Christ? Find him who is looking for you, his hand outstretched to bring you back. Let us know if we can help you right now as we stand and sing.